Okay. Hello. Right. I'm Terry Theobald, and this is that's really low here now. This is the stack. Can only get better after this. But um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not really a barbel angler, but I, I fish for barbel now and again because they're too easy to catch, and they really. But um, I'm gonna. I've, this is the third time I've done a talk at this show, and I've never talked about babble before. <laughs> I will talk about other things, and really, I want to get the babble out of the way and talk about something real uh, later on in, in my talk. So um, I thought I'd do a little bit of history, how I got into fishing, and uh, what I do outside of fishing. Uh, I do other things as well when I can, and um, talk a little bit about my life and how I got in, into going fishing as a little kid and then get on to where I went barbel fishing um, when they arrived on the Y. I was a late starter, really. And then get on to um, a few trips I've had since the last talk I'd done here, trips abroad and things. And uh, yeah, it's amazing, amazing fishing I've had the last few years. Enter, is it? And um, I'll talk a little bit, start off ab about uh, my life, what I do and things. And um, I sort of, when I was four, my, my father took me fishing. He was never a fisherman, but um, he took me fishing, and it was great fun in the little streams where I live in South Wales. And this was, this is one of the oldest pictures I could find. And you'll see, that's me in the foreground, that's me father. See the little legs down behind me there? That's my younger brother. Believe it or not, he's only four years younger than me and four foot shorter. But um, the guy in the background, with then was my cousin, but a lot of you will know now that he's my brother because you've been to see this nonsense before. But he's my brother. There's a lovely story there about incest and family problems in South Wales, you see. And this is what we got up to in them days, wasn't it? But um, he's now my brother, and even though he's not his father, my mother was. We won't go there. Um, but uh, and it's it's funny because now I mean he's 68. 68 now, and uh, I'm more of a brother with him than I am with the little one. But um, all fishermen, the egos match fishing, and uh, the little one there, he likes climbing mountains and fishing for wild trout with a fly rod and all. Waste of time, as far as I can see, but there we are. But um, that's one of the earliest pits I had with fishing's concerned. And my work as a job, I'm very, very lucky. They trust me to drive these things on the railway. And I drive and operate them, and it's really, a lot of my fishing is done all over the country because of these things. I, 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 we've got a 10-week campaign coming up in Shrewsbury, and I've already joined a syndicate for uh, the Crucian Carp, and I can't wait to start the season, get on the seven. And, and even though I'm coming up 65, I, I'll work a 10-hour night shift, sleep for three hours, and then I fish until I have to go back to work, and I do that all the time. Uh, every other weekend, I'll have a sleep. Uh, it's marvellous, but a lot of big fish and lots of fishing I've done is whilst I'm in work driving these stupid things. Eight million quid, and they trust me with it. Uh, I've only come off the rails once. Yeah, not in that, it's just me. Yeah. But um, also, for 42 years now, I've been a singer in a band, and uh, we get around, in the 80s I toured Europe, we toured around, supported the Alarm and Bad Manners, lots of bands on tour and everything, and I'm still gigging, this was a gig a few years ago, uh, doing my nonsense, and being, I took drugs, okay, and uh, had a great time doing this type of thing, and I'm in a covers band now, and we just have a bit of fun, you can see the guy on the left, he's six foot four, uh, he was 20 odd stone then and he always wears a sink plunger on his head, he's a strange old fella. But um, the funny th ironic thing is, the other three in the band all work in a psychiatric hospital, <laughs> might tell you something, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and I've loved it, gigging and I'm writing songs still, writing music in between fishing. And, um, oh, oh, this is my wife, I do spend a bit of time with her as well. This is my wife. She, she, embarrass, she embarrasses me now and again. This was on a cod trip a few years ago, cod fishing trip. And I mean, when you're fishing with your mates and your wife wants to come along, you don't want to look at that all day, do you? You know, you don't want that, do you? So I always tell her, put a pair of shorts on, love, for God's sake. 
if you know, notice just above her arm is the stretch marks and where she's had five kids and that. But um, I'll just leave it there for a second or two. Because it's the only one I got, my wife. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Any females in here? No. Back in the 60s, sort of mid-late 60s, uh, this old rogue, my grandfather, who was a, he was a local character. I live where the, seven, the second seven crossing is now, right on the banks of the seven estuary. And this old boy used to say to me when I was 10, 11 year old, this time of year actually, just pop down on the moor, he said, and get me some eggs. And he'd have me go on, I'd oblivious, and I'd be going on the moor getting um, lapwings eggs. You know what's safe, if there's four eggs, don't touch them. But if there's two, he said, have one. And he would eat lapwings eggs and moor ends and coots eggs and all sorts. And eels and anything, he would eat it. I, there's a real old picture of him back in the 30s with a 60 pound conger eel that he caught at Subbrook, where, you know, where the, the old Seven Bridge goes across now. Hell of a character, drinker. He, he always had one of them little brown cheroots in the corner of his mouth. And he was 91 when he died. He drunk all his life. He was a selfish man, always in the club. And, drinking and smoking and I went to see him a couple of days before he's before he died and he got his legs out of the bed and sat there and I said uh, I said he said I'm on my way out I said well that's all them fags you've been smoking and he said no he said can't be the fags I packed them in last month <laughs> 91 yeah but uh, a character but one thing he used to do is um he was, he'd eat the eels, and, and when I was tw sort of 12, 13, when my fishing, he used to say, go, get eels, and we used to, a gang of us would go out into the Seven Estuary, and back then, 60s, early 70s, all this grass wasn't there, it was all mud, and this is all built up over the last 30, 35 years, and it's all reclaiming itself, because the lavenet fishermen up there, they still go out in the estuary, and they find things that... They find skulls and, and bones and all sorts of different things where people used to live there. And the river widened and now it's reclaiming itself. But we would go out, and this is the second seven crossing. And if you go out the pillars, you can see out towards the middle, all the rocks. And we go out there, eel bashing. We were 12, 13 year old. And we'd be eel bashing, was basically a gang of lads getting filthy dirty with mud. And um, you'd lift the rocks pull the rocks up and there's pools underneath and eels underneath and the bashing bit you'd have a spade and with the back of a spade when they shot across the mud you'd hit them with the back of a spade put them in a bag or a sack and then uh, you take them home and my granddad I take him some eels he, and they normally still moving you know and he cut the head off skin it chop it up in chunks and it was down in his stomach within 10 minutes he'd, he'd and it's still wriggling in the pan and he's oh my god eels but um, great fun out there, and it was an instinct. You knew in when to come back, because you'd be out there, and you'd look in the distance down towards Newport Cardiff, and you could see the shimmer of the tide coming in, and you'd start walking straight line back to the bank. And sometimes, when by the time you got to the bank, there was three foot of water where you were lifting the rocks. It's that quick, whoosh, up the estuary. So... Uh, it, Amazing times as a kid doing these things. It was great. A lot of people lost their lives out there, but it didn't really matter to us, really. It was very dangerous. The kids don't go out there now. They just look at a little screen and have their lips done. Yeah, but that's a better picture. Where we were, this is sort of you, you see the big black bit out there. That, all that now, there's a deep channel through there. It was not there before they built the bridge. And we'd be out on that black bit there and pulling the rocks up, catching lots of eels. Good fun. Yeah. Great in it, not talking about Babel. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that was sort of where my fishing and childhood started. And I got into my 20s and I get picked up in my local pub 11 o'clock on a Saturday night and all my kit was in my mate's car and I go fishing, drunk. No, oh God. Good times. Yeah. But then, 
My first steps into barbel fishing was, I say, it was a late starter really, but where I lived there was no barbel. Um, I did catch one that was dyed blue, and uh, for some reason in Lydney Lake in the forest, in the late 70s, they put seven or eight barbel in there, and I caught one of them once, and it was dyed blue. Because their idea was, if they die in blue, anybody pinches them, they'll know where they came from. <laughs> but they didn't last long, a few years, and they were all gone. But uh, that was my first barbel, 1979, and then it was years and years later, um, someone said to me, there's barbel in the River Wye. Is there really? So off we went, naive, fishing up the Wye with um, uh, hemp and casters and the proper method, you know, it was the only way in one time, wasn't it? And catching lots and lots of barbel. It was, it was great fun. You, you, and you could catch sort of 20, 30 barbel in a day, in the daytime and all, and nothing over five pound. It was really good fun. Good fun. And it was a good learning curve, I expect. But um, and, uh, you suddenly found out in the summer, that I don't go near the Y nowadays because it's in such a mess in the summer when it's low and all, with all the muck coming out the chicken farms and all the weed gone and all such a shame but uh, it was always a good fishing to be had there still is in places especially on old Mike's stretch at Wiley lovely up there I love that place but um, this is just above Kern Bridge and it, it was up in flood find a little slack it was quite easy and I had uh, always you don't catch many doubles some people catch lots and lots of doubles off the Y but I tend to think they're about nine and a half pounds, you know, but uh, that's just me. But that was, I've only ever caught one brace of doubles off the Y in all the years of fish there, and I've caught probably thousands of barbel off the Y. But I had that thing, and it was, it looks lovely, but there was a smell around there, because it's all cabbages, and it stunk of cabbages. And I had a pheasant fly into my head there the same day. I was down the bank, and I, I looked up like that, and a pheasant flew straight hit me in the face. Ah. One very pheasant, I mean pleasant, but there we go. But uh, <laughs> that was <laughs> one of the brace. Um, that was the other one. That it's like two barbels stuck together, isn't it? You've got a, a 12 pounder on the front and a seven pounder on the back. So you got, well, that was the other one. Ugly, ugly old thing it was. And the, the barbel wasn't so good either. But yeah, it was good fun. Good fun. The Y is not a place you can fish seriously for barbel, you just go there to have a great day out and good fun, you know, you're never going to catch a monster, but sometimes it's better to have fun, isn't it? We, some of us sometimes, as I do, you tend to forget that we fish to have a laugh and have a good time and, you know, that's what it's all about, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, good fun up there, that was me learning curve. Back a couple of years ago, that Mike stretch at Wiley, I've probably been fishing there now 14, 15 years, and I've never caught a double off there. And I took this jammy guy, guy there, he'd never caught a barbel before in his life, blinkered carp angler, and a horrible day, hot, blue skies, just all wrong, everything wrong, low levels, and one of the tips went over, and uh, he paid 200 odd quid to have a day out with me. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Well, here we are. Um, my wife don't even pay anywhere near that to have a day out with me, I tell you. But um, no, he had that one, it was £10.12, I think. Oh, I was gobsmacked, gobsmacked. And what a gorgeous fish. But it was his first ever barbel. And I couldn't get through to him, reiterate to him how special that was, you know. And like, to him still at the time, a £20 cart from a puddle was more worthy than that. And I thought, this is brilliant, mate. This is. It's a double figure barbel off the wall, he's fab, it's fab. But um, he goes up there a lot now and he loves it. And, and that's the best way, isn't it? Yeah. But that was good fun, always great fun on the wall. Um, I'd recommend everybody go there still, but fish above the, fish above the chicken farms. <laughs> yeah. But um, over the years, I often watched read Dave Howell and everything catching barbel on the float and I thought what a great idea and I, I, I get into this because I'm a chub angry and I don't know how to trot a float and I have a bloody clue I didn't have a clue I went several times trotting for, for chub uh, for barbel and I never had a bite it was hopeless 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 and anyway I went I went up there 
Martin Bowler rang me and he said, um, I go in piking, he's, he's got like Martin, you know, he's special. And uh, he said, I go in piking, do you want to come up? So I thought, I'll go up for the day, I'll bring the trotting rod and have a go for the barbell. And at long last, I upped one, he, he caught, I think, four or five big double figure pike, I think he might have had a 20 as well, because you know, I always say about Martin, he could trot a float down your pee and catch in the puddle on the floor. He's a type of bloke he is. But um, I, I actually hooked one and I'd scratch my itch with the barbel uh, and God, it gave me a run around and it was a beautiful fish. And I thought it was typical of fishing the Y because I weighed it and uh, it just went over 10 pound. I thought, my God, I've caught a 10 pound. And Martin came up, he said, come on, we'll weigh it again. We'll weigh it properly. And, it, and we settled on 9.14 in the end. <laughs> And then I, I wonder how many people, you know, get fish that sort of size and it's easy. Oh, it's 10 pounds. So I think a lot of fish sometimes that are 10 pound off the Y are perhaps not. But if you do catch 10 pound fish off the Y, I'm sorry about that. They're nine and a half. <laughs> but as an itch scratched, I enjoyed it. And I've tried in a few places, lots of rivers now for, for the barbel. And I've, I've never caught another one yet. <laughs> So I ain't very good at it, really. But, um, yeah, I enjoy it. If you're out there fishing, it doesn't matter if you catch or not. It doesn't matter, does it? No. But um, then back, I don't know, 20 years ago, I, uh, I had this thing. I wanted to catch a big barbel. I wanted to catch a specimen. So, and at the time, I was working in Reading, and I fished. Went to Aldermaston Mill and paid lots of money and caught nothing. And then this guy told me about this little stretch at Thiel. It's about 100 yards long. And every wino and druggy in Reading was down there fishing for barbel. And I, I, the first day I walked on there, that's, that was it. It was a whiff of skunk in the air. And there was guys there chopping down trees and building fires and everything. But this guy said, oh, there's some real good fish there. And I was a good place to start, like. And, I went, and it was the wildest place. They were going down with carpets, their carpets under their arms, putting them in the swim so as they don't get muddy feet. And there was rods with 20 pound line coiling down into the water, fishing the, the bushes on the far bank. And as long as they had 10 cans and, and three or four joints and everything, they were happy, you know, and it, they were having great fun. And, and I give it a little thought and uh, I started fishing it and they were fishing the far bank so I started fishing the middle and then it was really deep under my feet and so I had a little go and, and started baiting up right underneath my feet where these guys were chucking it to the far bank big PVA bags and feeders splosh bang wallop and they were out of their boxes all night and peeing it oh it was a terrible terrible place I don't know if anybody been there that little free straight have you, have you it's true isn't it it was the most incredible place yeah, the whiff of skunk and urine in the air. Every barbell angler's dream. <laughs> but uh, I fished it and started thinking about it. And um, I was there on a sunny day in September. I didn't really expect the catch. Uh, and, and I had that thing. It was the shortest, fattest barbell I think I've still ever seen. And it was 1410. I couldn't believe it. it. It doesn't look more than about 11 or 12, does it? But it was solid, big, fat thing. And... Uh, there was a guy there fishing and he, he witnessed it and he's, he said, oh my God, he said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, we didn't believe there was anything like that in here. And I think he got caught a couple more times after that. But I caught it underneath my feet and it was undercut. And I, I got a long pole, hung the rig on the end and put it in and then pushed it right underneath, right underneath the bank. And um, I don't know, 30 seconds and off it went. I thought it was a carp. But um, I caught a big one. I'd had a big one, which was great. It's always nice to catch a big one. And that, that was it then. I, I wanted to catch lots more. But I haven't really. But uh, barbel fishing for me, I find it really difficult to get into really out and out trying to catch a big one. I have had a little go lately. Um, the season just gone. I fished the stretch of the Thames and never had a bite all season because I'm that good. Yeah. But... Um, Back in the early 2000s, I was working in Newark. Well, 
you know, well, there's a chance, isn't it? <laughs> Working in Newark. And I, I fished a lot on the Trent up at um, Fandon. This is the, the Nottingham Anglers stretch, the big bend field. Uh, supposed to be day ticket. The only people I saw there was foreigners fishing with lures and eating all the, or anything they could catch. But I caught loads and loads of fish from there, but never ever had a double. Uh, you think of the Trent nowadays. Um, loads, seven, eight fish in a day, and then work, go to work night shift and everything. Uh, thoroughly enjoyable though, just great. I, I love fishing. But um, good up there. And I think that was one of the bigger ones that I caught. It's just fish that was um, by that. There's a little day ticket stretch on a caravan thing. It's about eight pegs and in about 30 yards. Smeaton, that's it. Yeah, that was that was up by there. That was yeah. But uh, oh, I just thought it was a lovely picture more than anything. <laughs> yeah, to add that. Um, great fun. Just good fun catching up a trend. I mean, they cocked it up at Collingham now, aren't they? There's too much too much poo in the field. Yeah, but. Um, Spoilers, but uh, and I fished down there by the gravel works and everything. I, I can't remember, but I, think I caught about a dozen fish in three hours from that swim before, and the biggest one was about six pound. <laughs> You'd load the catch when at that size now, but there we are. Just good fun on the Trent. I love it, love it. I don't get up there enough really because it's four and a half hours away from my place, but um, good fun. And I've caught them right underneath the pillars there. I expect loads of you have been here and fished this swim, but I've caught them underneath the pillars and they're great fun because they want to get in there. Yeah, it's a hang on job. But um, it was a place, there, there's another guy who was talking to me last night about this place. And I was asked to do a talk about chub fishing by Nottingham Piscatorials. And uh, they put me in a little bed and breakfast in North Muscombe. And I went there, dropped my stuff off, went to the hall and did me nonsense about me chub fishing and that. And the lady who run the B&B, she said, I've, um, my garden goes down to the Trent. I said, oh, does it? And the next morning, I said, do you mind if I fish for a couple of hours? Because um, uh, I want to miss the traffic, like, you know, to drive home. And she said, yeah, go on, go on. I fished for an hour and a half and had two doubles and, a, and a, one about eight pounds. I thought, shit, this is all right, isn't it? This is all right. So I went, I went back there. I'd done a little film when I, for, for Drennan and, and um, up there in her garden. And I went back when, with my brother, who, who was, used to be my cousin, but he's my brother now. I went there with him. And, and we had a great week, and I used three rods and out there to catch loads and loads of barbel. And that's why I said, if Carsburg made gardens, and the amount of fish I caught there was unbelievable, and it was fantastic. And you, there was a pub next door, you could get food from 5 pm, the beer was cheap, and you had a and b you stayed in, it was quite cheap. But sadly, it's gone now. Um, she got quite ill, cancer and all, she sold up, and I think. People have bought it now that have got a big family or something. You can't fish the garden, which is such a shame. Such a shame. But you fished there, didn't you? you yeah. I, I was just trying to think then. Who was it? I was talking. It was you. <laughs> yeah, but great, 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 great place. And an opportunity, off, a chance opportunity. It was good fun. But I, I actually got a photograph of three. I don't like... When you come do something like that, I don't like having three rods up in the air. Ooh, look at him fishing three rods in the river. What the hell? But you could there. It was marvellous. And I got a picture of the middle rod. Took a click the camera, and the middle rod is over like that. I thought, I'd better hit it then. Yeah. And that was the stamp of fish all the time. Beautiful, almost uncaught babble. It was fantastic place. And most of them doubles. Most doubles, never caught any monsters there, just short of 14, which I guess is a monster. But wonderful, wonderful opportunity doing these type of things. Go into these places, you funny, at the least expect it, you find somewhere, don't you? Always, you find somewhere to have a little bit of a fish, whether it's these barbel, chub, them other things with scales, you know, banging scalers or something they call them. Crap, a carp. 
and that. Yeah. But, uh, oh, there's the three rods. That, that's, early mornings was like that. I mean, what a beautiful sight that is. Yeah. And they, them rods were banging over it all the time. Yeah. It's, you fish just downstream, out in front of the pub, really, downstream, and whack them down there. And wallop, over they go. It's great fun. I loved it. Loved it. Sadly, it's gone now. But, um, yeah, I just two doubles in the net at the same time. Uh, not many fish came out in darkness actually, but most of them are in the daytime, which is very obliging. But these two, I think it's about one o'clock in the morning and they both went off at the same time. And it was panic stations, panic stations, good, great. Yeah, when, when I went with my brother, he, it was perfect because my lines were going out into the middle of the river and because he likes catching rubbish, he trotting underneath the rods. Perfect week we had. He got plagued by pike and all sorts of things. But he, he caught bream and chub and roach and it's just full of fish. Full of fish. And there's a club on the opposite bank. I think it's home. Home. And all the, the anglers there were rushing past on the far bank and going right down the bottom of the stretch. And there were so many fish. They were driving past to get to the pegs that everybody fish, I guess. So I didn't mind. <laughs> uh, I think that was the biggest one I had from there, which was just short of 14 pound. But you look at the size of that compared to that 14 off the Kennet, the different size and length. And if you compare that, that looks like, you know, 24, doesn't it? But that's the Thames. But lovely fish, fin perfect, beautiful fish. Yeah. And no hook marks in the mouth. And no salt water. <laughs> But lovely, great fun. But, um, oh, I, I went down Collingham back just before COVID. And uh, I, w I went down there and it was rising. There was a huge flood. It was right. Well, if, if any of you have been down there to the 60s on the bend, this was how high it was. And it was coming up and coming up. And the bailiff come down, I was the only one down there, it's beautiful slack, you just knew there'd be barbel in there. And the bailiff come down and he said, you better um, off mate, he said, because this is coming over in a minute and I just managed to get off before it spilled over the road down into the field. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit eerie, but that's how I, I it was and it came way up higher than that. Yeah, that was good fun as well, good fun. And it was slack, slack, two ounces, old bottom and it was like, 14 foot of flood or something like that and you just knew there were fish there but he kicked me off spoilers some of them yeah but uh, oh I did have a season on Sutton and, and being Welsh the, being Welshman the actual mat was my bed and, and the other rolled up there was our pillow and we had a good time I can tell you yeah yeah I caught lots of things at, at Sutton. One barbel. <laughs> no. But, uh, yeah. yeah. We're divorced now. <laughs> Don't you like sheep? It's great. Yeah. I always, it must be a Welsh thing because English people don't seem to see it. You know Kev, don't you? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. See Welshmen over there? They know. They know. That's the equivalent to a leisure centre where we come from. <laughs> so, all right. Back a few years ago, I, 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 so I, I made a mistake of going on that social media and said, oh, I'm going to go up to Collingham. And, um, and then this bloke, this strange fella, said, Well, I'll, 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 wait a minute, I'll meet you there. I'll meet you there. I'll catch the train, Jerry Gleason suddenly it was it was going to be a nice quiet trip on my own and then this lunatic decided he wanted to come and meet me so uh, i met him off the train and he he was in a knot then i uh, met him off the train we went down and we fished the river for, for what three days and nights I, I fished there the first night waiting for him to turn up the next morning and i blanked i thought here we go here we go and then the only thing we had was dirty nail food uh, and he cooked every night and it was good that but we fished hard day and night 
never had a bite. Not one bite down there. Peg 25 and 26, easy ones, just you get down on the road, you get out and go in a swim, don't you? You don't travel far. But it was just a, a wonderful week, or I'd say three or four days, a blanked, three days and nights, blanked. And I, packing up after the third night, there's lots of real bad weather coming in, uh, 60 mile an hour winds and rain, terrible rain coming in. And we're packing up and Jerry's, Jerry, tell you what, eh, there's no one in, there's no one in, we are, let's go, we are, get, we are. So, oh God, here we go. So instead of packing up and driving home to South Wales, he's on to the bailiff. Can we go into here, mate? Can we go into here? And he said, Are anyone there? He said, no, they've not turned up. So the deal was, we could go up in the weir and fish this 1A and A, whatever it is, pegs. And um, if anybody turned up, we'd have, we'd have to go. So we did, and he said, they're not coming. He said, they'd have been here at eight o'clock. And so we settled in there sort of midday-ish. And uh, after three days and nights, I think it was 10 minutes and vunk, over it went. But it was a lovely day with all this foam. You hear people, oh, calling and we are beautiful, all these big babble and all. When it starts foaming up like this, and you've got real bad winds and everything, all that stuff was blowing in me brolly, me bedsheet was soaking, everything was soaking wet, it's horrible. What a bloody dump that is, eh? But, I mean, that, that was it. <laughs> I've got little bits of video and all, all that stuff, all on my bed chair and, and oh, it's horrid. There was a, behind me is a landing net on the ground. <laughs> and you were netting babble in this, it was horrid. What a place. Yeah, but um, a, a trip that was an absolute disaster suddenly on its tail turned because we suddenly um, had an opportunity and, and of course, you know, Kids are three and whatnot can catch barbel in Collingham Weir, can they? And within five minutes, I think it was, I had a double, and then the rain came in, and we had these couple here. Mine's actually heavier than his. He just weighed it wrong, I think. Yeah, but we were catching fish like this, and, and it started hammering with rain and, and whatnot. Oh my God, it was hell. But these guys missed out. But it was real good fun. And being with him, I mean, it's a laugh a minute with that geezer, isn't it? There's lots of you here fish with him, and he's a nutbanger, really. He makes me look sane. But um, just as darkness came, it was hammering with rain. And he, I think, from nothing, I think he had a 15, a couple of 15s and a 14. And, uh, and to take the pictures, my brolly is flapping and going. I'm underneath the brolly with the camera trying to get shots and the, the rain's hitting me in the face. I said, stop pulling up face. It's dreadful. Oh no, it is your real face. Sorry about that, mate. Um, but just on its head from catching nothing, it was one of those memorable trips, you know. I think it was four or five fish we had in, in two hours, o over 15 pounds. <laughs> it was nuts. But that's calling them weird for you. It's not real, really, is it? You can't really count it. But yeah, and I had that thing there. Notice I got a little bit of a sideburn thing coming on. That was in my handsome period, that was. Yeah, little sideburn thing. Just after lockdown, you know, I never had a haircut in lockdown. You didn't either, Paul, did you? No. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, good fun up there, but I guess as anglers, we've spoiled it now, haven't we? Because they've changed the rules and everything. Yeah, here we are, we do that. We've all been there, got caught short. I could tell you a few stories on the seven like that, but we won't go there now. Uh, I, I was really, I got to, I was really desperate on the seven once and I couldn't stop myself. And, and I was there all on my own. And on, you know, jet below Worcester and all, where it's really quiet and it's, oh my God, I could, oh my stomach's all right. So, I tucked myself down underneath a willow bush and I'm down there like that and just at the point of no return I heard a woman shouting her dog <laughs> and oh no <laughs> she, she didn't see me she just heard me <laughs> but sorry anyway we, 
as I, I, I suppose I, my barber journey has been quite, quite a large one. I've fished many, many rivers, uh, and it's only over the last sort of 20 years, really, uh, on my search for big fish, I've fished all the big rivers, Hampshire, Avon, Stour, and, and uh, uh, Thames, all these rivers, Trent, and the 1410 from years ago was still the PB, so an opportunity, I was working in Peterborough, and, and talking to a, a friend of mine who's in the Chubb study group, and I said, oh, I'm up, I'm up there working for a few weeks, and he said, well, come on and then, get yourself a ticket, come on, Neen or Nen or whatever you want to call it, or Neeny, with the way it's spelled, and um, so I thought I'd trot it for Chubb. So I went up there, my first day there, a 30-odd Chubb, and he was gobsmacked, he said, I didn't even know there was that many here, and I had 30-odd Chubb. But they were all small, I think this is the biggest, about three and a half, four pound. And um, I, went, I went home after a few days and went back up there and the level was, had come up, it was, all that was just covered in water. And um, he said, this barbel mine, is some good barbel. Oh, I'll have a go for that. Because they were all a little bit cagey, I mean, a little bit like Phil, Phil's been there and great, lovely place, but... Um, he said, go and have a go for the barbel. And I said, well, I'll have a go for that then, trotting's out, out the window. So I went and it was like that. And it was all in the fields. And if you can see under the rods, the water's coming out the field, a quarter of a mile upstream, it's coming out the river into the fields, and all moving down through the fields and then going back in there. And I turned up and, and I went down behind the trees on a little point and it didn't feel right. And I walked past this, is just a little, cattle drinky thing and it was I don't know, you know you get that feeling something drags you back and I just went straight back there and um, I put two lumps of meat right in the edge just in front on the right right of it just there just in front of that bit there not by there by there just there and the other one was by there and two lumps of meat in there and, and it started snowing and sleet and horrible and the temperature was too low for Babel and everything was wrong. All the cold water coming in off the field and um, huddled under the brolly. And two hours, uh, snow horrid. And then it stopped. And I, I got out from under the brolly, stood there in front of the rod, went, oh, God, like that. And the right hand rod went slam over when you least expect anything you know and, and um, at, at long last after years of searching all these places to try and catch a real big one all the places you'd expect to go and uh, I, I had it was that thing there and, and I was gobsmacked absolutely gobsmacked and it was at the time jammy git that I am it was um, I think the, the biggest barbell off the Nen for three years or something <laughs> my first bite <laughs> it's because I'm a good angler yeah yeah there's nothing yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah bit of meat drop it in thank you very much <laughs> but yeah but sometimes it happens doesn't it you work really really hard and then other times you just plonk it in and happy days but and I, I went back a couple of days later and had a 15 as well so it was great but you can see it's all up in flood and great great and I was buzzing for weeks after that. All the years of trying all these places to catch a big one and failing miserably. Because um, I'm not very good at barbel fishing. I don't really know why I'm here, to be honest. I know they keep asking me. I don't know why. I swallowed a fly. But uh, yeah, that was that. And that was so. So we, we got off the barbel because they're boring, really, isn't they? You don't want to hear about barbel. Because really, Fishing's about everything, and, and I sometimes despair, especially at carp anglers, with them blinkers on, and, and all they see is carp, and it's so sad, really, because there's so many thousands of fish out there ready to be caught, all different species, and a lot of fish a bit for barbel, fish a bit for everything, and carp anglers, and it's sometimes, if there's something I can teach you, because I ain't no good at rigs and all that rubbish, is uh, get out there and fish for everything, fish for everything. And um, you've got to have adventures. So I thought I'd, 
I've got th three adventures I've had since the last time I've done a talk here. I've had quite a lot of adventures, but I picked out three that were better. Uh, I'll talk about them now. How am I doing for time? Oh, I thought you were going to say bugger off. But there we go. I swore then. I said off. Um, yeah, so uh, that there is just sort of an introduction picture. Well, that's steaming out a couple of years ago from West Wales, fishing for sharks. Uh, and um, I think that day we had 65 sharks, I think it was. 65 blue sharks on the boats. Nuts. Absolutely crazy. But yeah, good fun. And it's just the adrenaline, and you're doing that, going out, two boats together, two, three hundred. Uh, outboards on the back just firing out there and everything you know this is great what a life yeah and doing that type of thing anywhere is just brilliant brilliant yeah it's either that or sitting behind three buzzers in it on a carp lake catching the fish the bloke caught last week yeah but um yeah back back in 2016 i think it was um uh, late october uh, I, again, Martin Bowler said, get up to Scotland with Ronnie Campbell. He said, it's great, catching skate. And I thought, I'll have some of that. So uh, me, uh, my mate Pritch, and my brother, who used to be my cousin, I don't know whether I told you about him, but um, he's a strange old fella, he is really. He's, I've got pictures of his testicles, actually, on the Ebro, but we won't see them today. But <laughs> that's another, I think I've talked about them, haven't I, here before? Yeah. We won't go there again because it's not a very pretty sight. But uh, we, <laughs> we went up to Auburn and um, the three of us, we had three days in Auburn uh, for the skate and we didn't know what to expect, not a clue. Uh, but we went with the, with the right skipper, Mr. Ronnie Campbell. Uh, um, he's retired now, he's handed the boat over and everything to another lad who's, who's equally as good but not quite so dry with the humour. But um, it just an amazing place the old package you know we flew up from Bristol uh, to to uh, Glasgow I had a car didn't cost much between the three of us two hours later we're on the west coast of Scotland and uh, in Auburn beautiful little town very friendly place what what's not to like and uh, so the, the first day we're steaming out we're going out and People had said about these fish, and Ronnie, he sort of looked at us three, sat there, weighed us up, and he said, uh, have you caught a big fish before? Um, yeah, Ron, yeah, yeah, we've caught big fish before. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. And so uh, he kept goading us and goading us and building us up and all. And anyway, we draw lots, and I, for a change, came out first. So the first bite was mine, and we had four rods out. And the bike came, it's funny, these tiny little knocks like that. And he said, there's one on. So I wound down, wound down and hit this immov immovable object. It was the most horrid thing. You ever think, like that. Nothing moves. Julian's laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. And nothing moves. And Ronnie stood there and it's five minutes. And I'm like this. And nothing moved. Have I got the bottom wrong? No. He said, do you, want a, do you want a pussy pad? I said, no, I'm all right at the moment, mate. Another five minutes. He said, I'll have that. Um, I'll have that pad, mate. Yeah, I'll have that. <laughs> so I put it on, put the rod in it, like that. Another five minutes. Do you, do you want a harness? No, no, I'm all right, mate. I don't want a harness. No, I, I sort this. I'm, you know, I'm experienced. I know what I'm doing. Another five minutes. I'll have that harness one. <laughs> I think I'll have that harness now. <laughs> And, and I, this thing is about 15, 20 minutes. And he come up, oh, and he said, what's oh, a wee baby? A wee baby? It was, I think it was 50 odd pound. And so I was thinking, we're out there to catch fish, poss possibly 200 pound. And this is 50 odd pound, and I'm wrecked. Absolutely wrecked, 50 pound. And we got three days of this. This is the first half hour. Of the, this is not a wise decision, this. We're getting on, you know. But within, within, and they're all killing themselves now at me, wrecked with this, what he called a, a baby. So within the half hour, all three of us are like that. And we think, oh my God. Now, that's, now, the one in the background there with a the bit of a scruffy beard, that is me brother, cousin, person. 
That's him. He's a bit of a character. But just before we went, he had his operation on his gallbladder and the old stitches across the front. It wasn't really a wise decision to go up here with this there because there was, there was a real issue with bursting out problems. But um, and <laughs> it's typical like that. We had three fish on and um, mine was the smallest, I think it was 110. Uh, Pritch in, in the, the forefront here, who's a character, is alcoholic, d drinks too much and he's another mess and his red face turned redder and we're, we've had, in the past, fishing with him, we've had to spray under his tongue, angina spray under his tongue because he's getting a little bit irate with the fishing. He'll keel over on us one day, we'll just chuck him over the side. He'll probably drink the sea anyway. But, um, but this was, I think mine was 110, something like that. Pritchard's about 135, and my brother cousin, he's fighting this thing. He had it on for over two hours, and, and he's absolutely worn out, really fatigued, in a mess. I thought he was going to pass out. But it was 158 pound, and it was a, a male. Apparently, the male skate fight really hard. They're, they're monsters of things and horrible. It's over two hours fighting this thing. <laughs> it was crazy, absolutely crazy. But it was our first day, and I'm thinking, we got two more days of this. But it was great. I mean, that was the bait. It was dropping, that was the bait. You can see the hook. Up by my elbow is the hook. And then that was the bait I was using. I was using two pound of lead, fishing in 580 feet of water. And I was counting it, timing it down. And for the bait, and everything, get to the bottom, took seven and a half minutes. Seven and a half minutes to get. And, You'd wait half hour, and Ronnie'd say, ah, "Bring them up, lads. We're rebate. What? <laughs> Bring them up." And it would take you ten minutes just to wind it up to rebate. It's nuts. But uh, I mean, just a crazy trip it was. A crazy trip. But the first day we caught, I think, fourteen skates. The first day, and my stomach muscles were gone. You know, well, one muscle. Look at it. One. Stomach muscles were gone, our arms, we were in a terrible state. And then it, Ronnie, he said, reel them up, boys, we'll go in. It was about that past four, quarter to five in the afternoon. And just as he said it, it was my turn on the rods again, a little tiny tap, and I went down on it. And for the next hour and a half, it was a war of attrition. And eventually this thing came up about 60 yards away from the boat and it flapped its wings in slow motion about three times and it was about 60 yards, 60 meters down again. And oh my God. And the, horrifically brilliant it was. But it was that, and that was 202 pound. Off the coast of Britain. It's nuts, isn't it? It's just superb. Yeah, 202 pound. And we thought that was the, the pinnacle of our three days. I mean, we were going to celebrate, get back, we'll have a few beers and a curry, we'll celebrate. And just across from the hotel was a little pub, and, uh, and, and that was that. I just sat in the pub like that. I, c I couldn't even lift my arms up to grab a pint. And I'm pretty good at grabbing pints, but I couldn't. I was absolutely knackered, totally worn out. That was the first day, and where three of us are sat there, and, well, we had, there was four of us, the other mate came with us, and he's into visiting churches and everything, a strange old boy. But he never, he don't fish, he just came with us to visit local churches and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, I have friends like that. Hmm. But uh, that was that, and we're thinking, two days to go. Oh my God, how are we going to cope with this? Luckily, the second day, we only had, we only caught seven or eight, it was like a rest. But my brother, cousin, person, that... My mother gave birth to, and my auntie brought up. He, he managed that one, and that was actually much, well, I can't say easier to bring up, but he, he had that one, uh, and that was 211 pound. 211, yeah. Oh, it's funny, do you know, he's, he's out of a character. He's a bone idle, lazy thing, he is. But um, I, twice now, twice I coaxed him to go fishing come on these trips with me, and he's always, oh, can't be bothered, oh, I've got to get a passport, oh, my God, I'd sooner just sit in the club and get drunk. And, uh, but uh, twice, I, I took him on the Ebro, and 
I've wound him up. He never caught a catfish. Never caught the biggest fish he'd ever caught was a carp in about 1980. It was 14, 15 pound. I took him to the Ebro, and he had a 166 pound cat. Uh, and and I, I admit, I choked up. I had tears in my eyes just cheering his experience because he'd never done anything like it before. And it was funny, and um, I gave him a good hiding after because I never had one that big. But but he had this 211, and it was. An amazing moment just to see him have that lovely and the, the, the look on his face was brilliant uh, that was the second day we had a day off really then the, the third day we had um, I think 30 we had 31 skate altogether uh, we had 18 over a hundred pound in the end <laughs> which and it's if you fancy something like that just look it up skate in Oban and it's just amazing, just amazing. Three days, don't go for any more than three days, you won't live. But uh, it's great, marvellous. Um, back, back a few years ago now, I, I uh, through Martin Bowler again, they, they booked trips to Jurassic Mountain Resort in Thailand. And I, I coaxed the wife, I said, come on, we go to Thailand, and oh, it's not going out there fishing. But I coaxed her out there and she loved it in the end. She thought it was brilliant. We're going back in a couple of years. But we went to this Jurassic Mountain. Oh, have you noticed the tattoo there, Wales? It's probably the best tattoo in the world. I don't know whether any of you people agree with that. No? All right. But, um, I mean, look at that gob on that. That's brilliant, isn't it? But uh, I mean, it's a holiday. It's a commercial place. But I sort of wanted to catch an arapaima, and I didn't want to spend 10 grand to go up the Amazon and trudge through the through the forest to try and find a pond that they haven't eaten them all but um and you went there and siamese carp and all these huge fish so why not have a holiday in thailand so we went to this place and i wanted to catch a red tailed catfish a hundred pound arapaima and possibly a hundred pound siamese carp and i thought it there for 10 days although that'll take me 10 days to try and get some of these things but I'd, um, i mean i did I did two of them on the first day. Um, I had that thing, I was about 65 pound, red tail. They became a nuisance in the end because you caught loads of them. And the most hard, hardest fighting fish that, that, that I'd ever come across, it was incredible. They just keep ripping line. And when you expect it to stop, they start going again. And But real good fun. Most easiest fish to hold up for a camera, they don't move. They don't move and they sort of got a sandy skin so they don't fall off either, it's great. Yeah, they like Velcro. But um, yeah, I had that thing and it was just an experience. And, and it's great, you get in the water for the photographs. The downside of that is there's little bitey things in there. And um, all underneath your toes, but my toes was all bites and everything, but you didn't really care. I just put cream on my feet every night and sit there with my feet up with no shoes and socks. It's sore, but it was worth it, you know? But uh, great fun. Uh, the first day, I, had, I, I don't know, four or five of them things, and I had a Siamese cat, catching Siamese cap, and my missus, she, um, this is a different one to the one earlier on, by the way, that's my real one, this is not a real one, but we went, we went there, and uh, two rods off at the same time, and then my wife hates fish. She won't eat them, she won't go near them, she hates fishing, she hates the fact that I talk about fishing incessantly, day in, day out, and all, all this stuff. And the other rod went off, and I'm playing that one there, I'm playing it, and I said, you've got to hit it, hit it, hit it. So she played it, and fair play, she, she played the fish, it's the only fish she's ever played in her life, the only fish she's ever caught, and I think it was 45 pounds, so he's got one fish he's ever caught, yeah. I wasn't having it, mine, mine was bigger, yeah. but um, brilliant, and she actually got in the water as well with all the bitey things and the things, and, and had a picture, yeah, she said she would never go in there again, and, and I had an arapaima later on, and uh, she got in, in the water with the camera again, it was great. There's a, a wonderful swimming pool there, and she's in, in the swimming pool one day. <laughs> And a six foot monitor lizard come down, <laughs> down into the swimming pool. She's in there on her own like that. And this six foot monitor lizard swimming across to her. She wasn't in there long. No. No, but 
great. I love that picture just for the fact that she's holding a fish. Yeah. I think she chipped a nail as well, which wasn't very good. Uh, and later on in the afternoon, um, I had an arapaima. Uh, I think it was about 150, 160 pound. And I thought, wow, this is the first day, you know. This is the first day. This is an amazing place. And uh, commercial. You can't say it's anything other than a commercial, but it's a holiday. And I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Great. And yeah, I had the arapaima. I think I had six arapaima. It's typical. I thought I'd never go there again, but I, th I had an arapaima, the biggest, about 220, 240 pounds. And then I'd think to myself a year later, I'd like to catch a bigger one. <laughs> and that's the way it is. And this fishing, they call it char prior, and they, they really hard fighting lunatic fish. And they go on over 100 pounds, so I want to catch one of them now, because I can. <laughs> Before I get too old, and can't do it. But, um, Nearby, there's all these things to do. There's an elephant sanctuary within half hour, and they come and pick you up, and they take you there. And there's, and it was tremendous. They rescue all the elephants that are being abused in Thailand because the the treatment of animals is not the best, and they do lots of horrible things to animals. And there was the elephant sanctuary, and there bears there and other animals, but this. The elephants, you could walk with them like this, and if you fed them all right, you were okay. But uh, there was one elephant there that you couldn't go near. He killed seven people. He was a angry boy, he was, angry boy. But he killed seven people because they'd abused him, so he'd give them a slap. And if you get a whack with a, with a trunk like that, it hurts. But it, just experience, the local town, Charam, the local town is five minutes in a taxi, and. There's markets there, and, and you've got to try I, I, sort of battered scorpions and these buggy things and everything. Great fun. Yeah. The only thing is, I walked around for the rest of the week and left a trail behind me. Don't know why. <laughs> like a slug. But tremendous place. And, and you always see photographs, don't you, of these perfect fish and all these things. You have them under the water, and then you come up five seconds and if you don't get your picture this happens uh, oh good fun I, I had more pictures like this than what I had real good ones <laughs> tails out there real good fun great fun yeah and beautiful beautiful place nearby there's um, a cave back cave and this they estimate 13 to 14 million bats every evening come out of this cave and you go there and stand on a platform and you pay something like three pence to stand on this platform and look at this cave and then on dusk these bats come out and they fly in a trail that way and slowly slowly they fan out right the way round to the distance that side and just go feeding and, and just to watch them you know it's amazing 13 million bats. I tried, but I got to about 14 and lost count. But just all these things and the lizards and snakes and, uh, and all these things. They were telling me um, a couple of years before I went there, they had in the paddy fields next door, there was an anaconda, big anaconda, at the 20 odd foot, and they reckon it was trying to get over the fence to get in, could love it in the lake. And I said, we're getting in this lake. <laughs> 20 foot anaconda in there. Yeah. There was one about four inches when I was in there. Yeah. But I say, I, I, I sort of had the red tail and, um, and uh, the arapaima and, and a, a Siamese carp. I really wanted to catch a big one. And I had that one which was over 90 pounds. And the week went on and I caught loads. I think I had 40 or 50 of these things. Siamese cap. They, look at the tail on it. When it flaps that tail, it's gone, isn't it? <laughs> God almighty. But it was, it was great. And I had that 90 pound. And the week wore on. I thought, oh, I'm not going to get one over 100. And then the last two days, I, I, I just went down just to have a bit of fun, went in a swim. And the first bite was, it was only, I was only fished for an hour and a half, two hours in the afternoon. And um, it went off 
and it took me nearly an hour to get it in and it was that one and it was one that they knew there uh, it was over 180 pound you couldn't weigh it but they they had weighed it in the past it was over 180 pound and um, that was the last but one day and uh, the following day I went down there and I caught another one that was equally as big and at the time there was three in there 160 170 plus and uh, I caught two of them and there was another one Scarface they call which was the biggest which was not in 200 I think but uh, uh, two of them so it, I'd achieved everything I wanted to go there and do and had a great holiday and went on the beach the beaches are wonderful it was just good I did get drunk once as well but um, yeah great place and uh, just four weeks ago I um, I booked well back in 2020 I booked a trip to Norway uh, to fish for cod and um, Covid cancelled it and uh, so it was I, I cancelled my flights the flights could be 650 quid cancelled and got the money back and then 2021 Covid again uh, never even booked flights so I booked flights again to go uh, back in um, early April and it only cost me £503 so I had a result there really but uh, to go out northern Norway I mean, the trip was just something else four of us went and we went from Heathrow to Oslo Oslo to Tromsø and then from Tromsø right on to Soroya Island right up in the Arctic Circle north of Norway and we'd left this country and this is what we got to I mean the airport at um, Hasvik there's four villages on the island thousand people and um, the airport we walked out the airport and it, the airport was a big shed thing with six chairs in it was just mad it's great you know what an experience before you even fish and uh, we got there that was the camp over in the back there was a camp and you stayed in there in the boats going out and cod we wanted to catch cod and back in 2020 the guy said to me he said, oh, you, you will catch big cod, very big cod, ah, yeah, world record, oh, of course we will, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what it's like. You, if you catch a 10 pound cod in Britain, you've got an absolute fish of a lifetime. So anyway, we, we sort of didn't know what to expect. They had had a few big ones, but that, that was it, that was the boats, uh, 250 horsepower engine on the back, and they just fire so fast. Um, and it was great I togged up I spent about three or four hundred quid on on all the gear so as I want cold it was minus 10 minus 12 at times um, it did come up to minus one and started thawing and that was warm that was that was coat off job by the time by the end of the week but uh, it started off incredible I mean we come out the airport and within two minutes three minutes the guy driving us stopped and um, he, he stopped he said get out and have a look and there's the northern lights right above our heads and I, my god not a bad way to start a trip is it an adventure but um, that was the place and uh, the first day I think was first or second bite uh, I had that was 48 pound and I thought oh, this is all right isn't it uh, cod we caught I think we caught a 20 odd the first day I tried keeping tabs on the weights and um, 48 pound that'll do me I don't have to go fishing again the rest of the week but when the afternoon I had that thing and uh, they estimated it, it had spawned out uh, they said it probably over 80 pounds two, two or three days earlier uh, and, and that was 52 52 pound cod <laughs> 52 pound cod and it, and it was slowly turning into a, a trip of a lifetime you know we, uh, it was amazing and I've taken the mick out of them the first day because that was the biggest one and I, I'm a big fish catcher what came after that was just unbelievable but um, look at the head on it and the fish is big as well but it was unbelievable you see the background all the mountains covered in snow and just unbelievable unbelievable and every evening when we came in well the first when we got there we got there about 11 o'clock at night and settled in got into bed about half past one in the morning half past three the alarms going off um, and we were going back out 
to fish. We're going out to fish four o'clock in the morning because the weather was turning bad in the afternoon. So we went out for the morning. But some of the evenings coming back in, that was the sight as you're going back in, you know, it's just beautiful. Stunning place, stunning place. And um, I think on day three, it was quite choppy and whatnot. And uh, big lures, six and 800 gram uh, lures over the side and just doing this. And the real big cod, they come up from underneath and they come up and just engulf everything and you get a big slack and there's wind down, hit, and then they, the, well, they want to get back to the bottom then. And, and I had this bite and everything locked up and, and the skipper said, not a cod. Yeah, yeah, got to be a cod. And it, 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 um, it turned out it, it was uh, a 50 odd pound halibut, which was fantastic. And what a fight and what, what a, what a creature. So I was going to make it a one-off trip and they'll want to go in the summer because these things will go up to 200 pounds. So, and that was 50 odd pounds. So again, another adventure has opened up more freaking money. <laughs> but you've got to do it. You've got to do it. Um, yeah, that was a bonus fish. I had wolf fish as well. I don't know if you've seen wolf fish, but they're the ugliest things you will ever see in your life. Yeah. But um, I mean, the one day we went out, and what happens in the fjord? All the males are there waiting. They're waiting, and you'll get a shoal of big females come in to spawn, and and they do a lovely dance on the bottom. You'll have one female, and the males wrap around them, and they come up dancing in the water right off. And you could see them on the sounder doing this, swirling like this. One big female, two or three males, with them, and. The females come in on block, spawn and do their dance, and then they go to sea for a year, and you never, you don't know where they are in the Bering Sea. And we were searching for the females. They were there the night before. The following day, they'd gone, and all there was were these males. So we, we went out six or seven miles, and uh, we saw all these thousands of birds. Um, so we headed for them, and when we got there, we thought it's perhaps cod eating the smelt and eating all the small stuff. But what it was, it was dolphins and whales. There was fin whales there, huge, big things. Uh, they're the second biggest whale in the world, and they're there hitting smelt, and dolphins there hitting smelt, and all the birds diving on the bits of fish that they'd missed and everything. And it was absolute carnage, but we packed the boat in the middle of it, and it was all going on around us, you know, and just amazing thing. But I managed to get some real good photographs, I had pictures of the, a whale coming up out the water with his mouth wide open and it's a little bit blurred but you can see the fish going in its mouth just scooping all these fish up but, and, and there was dolphins doing this all over the place, all around you and I managed to get a few shots like that, I thought that I can't put lots up so I'd, that's what it was like, you know, it's just unbelievable, unbelievable but um, we, uh, how am I doing for time? 10 minutes? Make it five. <laughs> but uh, that was what it was like. And again, a, a, a trip of a lifetime. Trip of a lifetime. And I think it was on day four, day four or five, uh, the big females had turned up. And this guy is um, Chris Carter. He's from down Ringwood Way. He's a bit of a character, but he came along with us. And. Um, he had that one, and that, it had a bit of spawn in it still, but it was 72 pound. 72 pound cod. <laughs> That's like catching a 50 pound barbel, isn't it? You know? So we never thought, we never dreamed that we'd see this uh, cod of that size. But uh, I, I haven't actually totaled up, but I think I had 15 or 16 maybe more over 40 pound because the last two days we, we caught about 140 cards in the last two days and i just lost count of the big ones and we only weighed it sounds crazy but we only weighed cod that we thought were perhaps over 50 pound yeah and you couldn't because there was someone having a bite all the time it was mad but he had that at 72 pound and um 
the, the guide guy, they're two young lads, and they're unbelievable, they're, they're stamina and whatnot, and they do this every day. And they were, they said, good chance of a monster. And we said, 72, and there's a chance of a monster. So anyway, um, we took that on board. And um, on the last but one day, he, he had this fish uh, spawned out at 83 pound, 83 pound cod. And um, the IGFA world record, the length, is 153 and a half centimetres. And this was 157 centimetres. Uh, and uh, the biggest cod for weight is 103 pound, the world record. And they said, by measuring it and, and doing whatever they do, two days before, this would have been about 110, 115 pound in weight. God, you know. There's not a plate big enough, is there? But... 83 pounds, it doesn't do it justice really, it's all bent up, it was huge, absolutely monstrous. So a technical world record, you know, just, they were true to their word, it was an amazing trip. But um, it, it didn't end there, my mate Carl from Cardiff, who's a fly angler, he, uh, he decided that he, he wanted to get in on the action, and that's Carl there. I, I forgot to say he has a very bad wind problem. He had terrible trouble. He was like that all the time. Pass and wind, terrible it was. Um, yeah, I mean, look at the face on that cod. You wouldn't want to be sat on someone's, on Carl's lap when he was passing wind, I tell you now. But <laughs> that, was a, that was a mid-50, that thing was. But Carl decided he wanted, um, he wanted to catch cod on the fly and he, he made the effort of taking fly rods with him in a tube and everything, and he was determined. And the IGFA world record uh, is open for a fly caught cod. And he, he had seven or eight altogether, but he had a 56 and a 52 pound cod on a fly that he'd made himself at home. And, and um, so I said about claiming a record, he's interested, you know. But so it, it happens, and the guy said it's the first time they've ever known anybody catch a cod out there who's stupid enough to fish for them with a fly rod. But it's, um, he caught tap on in Florida with, with that same rod and, and he knew, he was confident, if he up one, he'd land it and he did and it never took him any longer with the fly rod as it did with, you know, with the proper sea fishing tackle. But that was his serious face, he, he'd passed a lot of wind before that one so that was a serious face. <laughs> and, yeah, amazing, on the fly. What an experience, you know, just to be there and, and be part of it. But um, yeah, that was him afterwards. Yeah, yeah, totally drained of everything. <laughs> but uh, my biggest, my, the biggest one I had was 61 pound, and I kind of say that, well, oh, 61 pound, but 61 pound, God. Uh, mad. And we, we had them two, um, both at the same time, uh, 56, mine was I think, and Carl's at 52, 52, 53. Just, I can't say what an incredible trip it was, and I'd recommend, have a look. Go to northern Norway, it's an adventure of a lifetime, and catch cards. Go in the summer and catch halibut. Uh, just go there, just being there is amazing. Just an amazing place. Crazy place. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, it was a wondrous experience. And that's what fishing is, isn't it? Every day, even if you blank, something happens and it's a wond wondrous experience. So um, here we are. But um, that's the end, chaps. It's fun. Well, it's funny that, that I was out at huge cards one minute and then out fishing for roach and it's equally as fulfilling you know it's marvelous that you can go out and catch something like that and catch a 200 pound fish and then catch a roach and just happy days you know wonderful yeah that wasn't a bad one was it <laughs> but uh, anyway chaps Never forget when you're fishing, variety is the spice of life. Don't get bogged down in too many things. Get out there and fish for it all. Do it all because it's a wonderful, 
wonderful sport that we all take part in and there's lots of negatives that we get involved with sometimes but just remember you don't have to do it you do it because you want to you love it and I, and I love my fish and I hope that comes across that I just love going fishing anyway thanks for listening hope you have a good day cheers